Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. As I've mentioned here before, maybe the most often asked question that I get will be something along the lines of, what do I do about the fact that things are so tense with my family? Uh, and, and it seems that usually most of that tension is really comes down to parents and kids as it relates to politics uh, over the past several years. And we're going to talk about some of that a little bit uh, later with uh, my special guest today. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to sort of build the background of how those of us in evangelical Christianity ended up in this situation at all. I have with me today my friend John Ward, who is the chief national correspondent for Yahoo News. He has been covering politics for a long time, two presidential campaigns, and he's written a, a book that I really like, and those of you who are political junkies will really like Camelot's End about the 1980 campaign between Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy. And now he has written a new book that is very different. Uh, it's called In, uh, Testimony Inside the Evangelical Movement that Failed a Generation. Very personal book, as we'll talk about uh, here in a few minutes. It's out in April. We'll put a link to it uh, in the show notes. But John, thanks for being with me today. Hey, Russell. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I, I'm wondering with the book, you really grew up in a religious world that kind of combines two or three things that most people don't put together. The Pentecostal charismatic um, uh, movement uh, in American life, uh, really coming out of uh, Azusa Street and then on into the charismatic renewal in the denominations in the 60s and then out through the church growth movement in the 70s. The, the Jesus uh, movement sort of coming out of hippie culture revivals uh, in the 60s and 70s and the new Calvinism. Uh, th those things in most people's minds don't come together, but they were together in your world. Uh, describe to us what that was like. It didn't all happen at once, which is important to to note. Um, you know, the charismatic and Pentecostal um, influence was very heavy in the early days of our church, and that was in the seventies and eighties. And then, you know, one of the amazing things that happens when you write any kind of reflection on your life is you begin to look at the chronology, mm -hmm. and one of the one of the most interesting moments in the last couple of decades is the mid nineties when you have what was referred to as the Toronto blessing, um, which was a, um, very intense, you know, set of church services up in Toronto with a, a lot of pretty wild manifestations, laughing of, revival. And so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And it was actually pretty, we actually, as a church went through a period of doing that in the mid nineties. I graduated high school in 95. And just as I really became the most intense in my faith in my entire life, um, in my second and third year of college, our church did a real hard pivot into this new Calvinism. Um, and that's a whole story all on its own. But yeah, we, I had a very sort of charismatic upbringing. And then at this moment in my life, when I became very zealous, uh, we became Calvinists. And so as I kind of thought about this um, trajectory, it was kind of remarkable to me that I've experienced two or three, as you mentioned, very different um, dynamics and that there were a lot of leaders um, in the early days of our church who split off in two different directions and have all had fairly prominent um, 
you know, paths and roles and controversies. Yeah. One, one of the founders of, of the church you grew up in, uh, CJ Mahaney is a very uh, recognizable figure, at least in, uh, evangelical Christianity for all sorts of, um, reasons, a, a very, uh, powerful, skilled communicator, somebody who sort of joins all of these streams uh, together and somebody who has been very, very uh, controversial over the past uh, several years. Um, in, in growing up uh, as an evangelical Christian, it, it seems to me sometimes there are people who the world around them, the, the church world around them just seems so normal that they kind of assume everybody mm. lives this way. And then later it's, oh, wait, you don't, you don't know who Larry Norman is? You don't know the rapture? Uh, and then there are other people who feel kind of besieged um, all the time. And it's always the, the outside world is hostile to you. And sometimes those people are kind of surprised when they find out, well, actually people don't hate me as much. Mm -hmm. They just don't think about us uh, that much at all. Which of those categories were you closer to growing up? Um, probably closer to the second, but I, I would not put it in those terms per mm -hmm. se. I, I kind of experienced sort of a double alienation growing up because mm -hmm. um i was we we were so insular as a church in this bubble that we created for ourselves that um we you know we weren't we weren't totally you know self-enclosed so we went to the grocery store and we knew people outside the church yeah. and you know i played on sports teams but you know i did go to a church school and all this thing so i I was, and I think as a, as a church, we generally were pretty alienated from the community around us, and there was a sense of difference, and it was a stark difference because I grew up in the suburbs of Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C., so it wasn't exactly Waco, Texas, mm -hmm. right, or the Bible Belt. But uh, for myself, I was also alienated from the church environment as well, which I think is the seeds of this book. Um, I just, there were things in the church culture that never, you know, some things that never quite sat right with me or just that I, I just didn't completely fit in. And I, I don't want to overstate the case. I wasn't, um, I, I've always kind of been in between in a lot of different ways, even as I write about in the book, I could get along. I, um, you know, was able to make conversation with adults. And when I became a 20 year old, I was on the track to, to leadership, but I, I just think instinctively I ask the question why a lot. It's just part of who I am, part of kind of, you know, what, how I was formed as a child and part of my DNA. And that, and that, <laughs> that's not always welcome in the church. Yeah. How, how do I think one thing that a lot of people are trying to sort through when they're sort of looking back at uh, church experiences that they've had, maybe the, the upbringings that they've had, and especially in recent years, as we'll we'll talk about in a few minutes, when we we see sort of so many of the things that you, that you talk about in this book that have emerged really clearly, some of the political um, political manifestations, the scandals, the cover ups, those sorts of things happening. A lot of times, what people are confused by is they're sort of looking back and they're trying to piece things together and they're saying, was I in a situation of sort of spiritual abuse or was I in a situation that just really emphasized accountability and uh, biblical purity and those sorts of things and maybe did it wrongly? How, how would you counsel somebody to start even sorting through all of that? Or is that even, is that even a worthwhile question to ask? I, I do think it's a worthwhile question to ask. I mean, what I would consult most people to do is to seek uh, <laughs> experts mm -hmm. on spiritual abuse. You know, and my friend Dan Koch um, is one of the first people that comes to mind, but there's lots of people out there who have studied this. Um, and uh, I, I think our experience in our church included, you know, both. There were 
examples of clear spiritual abuse. I personally think a lot of um, the ways that, uh, you know, people just sort of claim to speak for God uh, to get people to get in line or or do what they wanted. I think that's a form of spiritual abuse. I don't know if that would be characterized as such by people who have studied this more closely. Um, and then, you know, that's sort of on the, the lighter end from um, people who are sexually abused or physically abused and then sort of pressured or manipulated into, uh, you know, not seeking restitution or justice uh, through, you know, these claims of divine will um, over the, the leadership's sort of um, point of view. You know, one of the things that I've noticed in in talking to people who have come out of the the movement of which you were a part, and this, of course, is not necessarily representative of, of everybody, but just some of the conversations I've had, sometimes it ends up being kind of the worst aspects of Pentecostalism with the worst aspects of Puritanism together. So you would have people who would have both this sense of uh, God is speaking to me directly through my leaders. And if I'm, if I am asking why that means I'm fighting God, which is, is common in, in some Mm -hmm. forms of Pentecostal circles. And at the same time, this sort of rigorous introspection Mm -hmm. of where do I see the signs of grace and am I humble enough and I think I might be humble enough, which is a sign I'm not humble enough, which is a sign that maybe I'm not a Christian and maybe God's not pleased with me. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was there something, was there something about the system itself that contributed to that? You put your finger on the Pentecostal element and um, sort of the ways that leaders can manipulate um, the voice of God as they claim to, to be hearing it. I think the alchemy that we experienced in that church that was unique was emotionalism mixed with, uh, (laughs) the really intense Calvinism because the, the foundation or the, the culture of the church for a long time was, as we talked about charismatic. So, you know, based in the Jesus movement, the revival, this sense of euphoric religious experience. And a lot of what I experienced as a child and into my teen years was an attempt to recreate over and over and over this euphoric emotional state, which you still see in a lot of churches as sort of the highest experience of the divine. You know, we, you can have this debate over, um, what's been happening at Asbury College. Um, and and, I, and I'm not here to criticize, you know, I think I'm pretty careful in my, in my book to explain why this is such an attractive, you know, mode of, of religious experience for so many people and attracts so many adherents. Um, but, you know, that was sort of our baseline. And I do think the problem becomes when, when emotional or euphoric experience becomes sort of the goal. Um, and that, and that distracts from other parts of Christian living and discipleship and the divine presence. Um, I think it also short circuits the role of the intellect. Um, but then you kind of take that emotional intensity and layer on top of it, the really, uh, hardcore, uh, self, uh, introspection and the search for rooting out sin and the belief that basically everything you do is sinful. And that kind of amped up that experience that I had. I don't, I think it was common for a lot of people, but I'm already an introvert at the time. And so I think it really amped up that experience that I had of this cycle of, um, an, uh, an emotional experience followed by, you know, this process of, self-loathing based on, you know, real or perceived sin in myself. Um, and then a process of trying to work my way back to uh, a state of righteousness. It was, um, I think as I write, it was probably the most unhappy part of my life, which was when I was most into that 
that world. It was it was very toxic, maybe is an overused word in these discussions, but it was not healthy. And my my own parents recognized that at the time. Mm. They did. And so what, what they did. did they yeah. what did they do? I mean, how how do you how do you work through when you're already embedded in a situation like that? You you have children you're rearing in a situation like that, and you start to recognize that. How do you how do you step back from it? Yeah, my dad would see me coming back from meetings with other men, you know, all in our early twenties, all sort of sitting around a, somebody's kitchen or at a Starbucks talking about, you know, how many times do we look at pornography? Mm -hmm. um, how many times did we masturbate? These kinds of like very intense and uncomfortable things that aren't really meant to be discussed in these settings, in my opinion, and, and just an unhealthy obsession with, um, with that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so he saw me coming back and really just sort of in the depths of despair a lot of times. And he recognized that was not healthy. So he would try to talk me through it. You know, he definitely made it clear to me that he thought I, I was in a loving way. I mean, my dad's a very gentle guy. You know, he, he made it clear that he thought I was, um, too down in the dumps and he would try to, you know, talk me through, um, you know, the book of first John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, um, but I think, you know, he was very invested in the church, even though he'd been best friends with CJ Mahaney in high school and then kind of shoved out of leadership in the church after about 10 years. Um, he was still very invested in the church and what it stood for. So I think there was a limit to the extent that he could kind of pull me out of that setting. Cause I think he, to some degree saw it as good that I was, you know, um, really all in. Mm. How how much do you think was dependent? And the reason I ask this is because it's something that I I think I see in religious movements all over the place. How much of it is dependent upon the personal charisma and story uh, of the leader? So, I mean, as as somebody who has been around uh, C.J. Mahaney, um, he he is a He's a very powerfully personable uh, kind of kind of person. When he gets up and gives his his own personal testimony, really, really clear delineation from where he was as kind of mm -hmm. a stoner high school student <laughs> to right. uh, to a, a Christian preacher. Um, how how much do you think was dependent upon that that, that people were able to look at leaders and say? Uh, I I like them and I can I can sort of see the storyline in their lives that I would like to see in my own. You know, there's been debate over the years among people who were in this church about whether it was a cult or cultish or not. There was definitely a cult of personality around uh around CJ. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I think the clearest example I can give is just that people would talk like him. They would adopt mannerisms like him. There are a lot of young guys in the pastor's college who would dress like him or shave their heads like him. So um, you would have in worship services, people sort of, I don't know that it was conscious, but they would mimic the way he would sort of sway at the front or move his body. So, and, you know, again, the, there was a lot of language that was picked up. And so, he was, you're right, he was a very powerful and probably uh, you know, still is a very powerful communicator. It was always stood out that he would cry pretty much every sermon that he gave, you know, whether it was extended weeping or a little bit. He was just very emotive. And I don't, I have no idea like how much of that, I, I don't even want to speculate on whether it was manufactured or what. I have no clue. It's not an it's not really an interest of mine, mm -hmm. but you know, it was not your standard um, sermon that you would see in a Presbyterian church. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so he definitely, I think over time consolidated control of the church and of the movement, you know, Larry Tomzak was sort of a competitor for a while and was eventually kind of moved out. And it was really that 
you know, it was like 2012, summer of 2012. I had been sort of removed from the church for several years by that point. But when I read a transcript of a conversation that um, CJ had had with Larry years before that, and I saw the manipulation that uh, CJ attempted to to um, have over Larry um, in some really ugly ways, I, I realized even then how strong that uh, hold was that had been created in this culture of really elevating him to um, a status where I think a lot of us just thought, oh, this guy can't do any wrong. Now, you're, you're a political journalist and a lot of the places that you have to go and, and you, you mentioned this at, at one point can be crazy. You know, especially in a lot of these places, whether you're talking about the political world or the religious world, often walking through the exhibit hall maybe tells you more than actually sitting in the in, in the room where where whatever is is taking place in terms of talking. And so you have kind of seen the grifter side of uh, American politics and the uh crazier side of American politics in various ways for you when you're when you're looking at that does it cause you to say okay I see how human nature works and this can happen in any arena or does it cause you to look back and say well maybe maybe what I was participating in was just this just kind of grifting uh fraud or, or, or do you find yourself mm. kind of going mm. back and forth and, and, and elsewhere with it? Yeah, I don't – I really don't think that most people in the church I grew up in were frauds. And I don't mm. think that most people in evangelicalism are frauds. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of those people around. But I think by and large – well, I mean my experience was, was not that. It was an intensity of belief and certainty that I think blinded people. Mm -hmm. to um, the need for accountability, a need for um, institutionalism, and the need for uh, the wisdom of history and tradition. Um, mm -hmm. Those would be the main things I think that were missed. Um, and I think the thing that blinded them, the leadership to that, was that they had been part of this very profound experience. They were rejecting the what they saw as dead institutional religion of the Catholic church and the mainline congregations coming out of the post-war mid 20th century. And um, when you have a really high, high um, you, and you're young, you can tend to think that you've got maybe not all the answers, but a lot of them. And that was, I think the fatal flaw that led to everything else. And it, it seems that the Jesus movement and the new Calvinism uh, almost were trying to address certain problems, and they were in many ways opposite problems. So uh, Jesus movement and some of the charismatic movements are saying, as you, as you mentioned, dead, institutional, rote, uh, just go to Sunday every week and read the responsive reading and mumble out the songs. That's not book of acts mm -hmm. and that needs to be corrected and then the new calvinism of which which i've been a part and and i remember when i was drawn to it it was largely because i was looking at a really shallow mm -hmm. uh kind of market driven um revivalism and saying there has to be a connection to something bigger Mm -hmm. than this moment that goes, you know, as Timothy George uh, famously used to say, there's some, there's something between Jesus and your grandma and, and can connect you to, to a really intellectually and historically robust sort of, but that then leads to its own kind of, uh, marketing and its own kind mm -hmm. of, um, it, it, its own kind of um, confusion of the gospel with abstraction. So it, it seems they're both trying to address these problems. How how do we find the kind of balance? And I, I suppose it's 
wouldn't just apply to the church, but it would apply to all sorts of, of places in our lives. How do we find the balance that's not just sort of um, overreacting to the last bad thing? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I've puzzled for many, many years, gone back and forth, you know, between this tension between the need for spontaneity and emotion and passion and the need for order and um, tradition and rootedness. And, the, you know, and you also can look at, you know, well, is the is the is is institutionalism the answer? No, it's not the answer. Look at the Catholic Church; they've had lots of scandals. Um, so I don't think you can ever really answer the question of um, is it one or the other. I think it's you need both. And um, when you when if we're going to talk about structures uh, and governance, you know, I think you have to find a middle way um, that that takes from some of both. I think you know. In those early days, our church really overreacted. And then I think to your point, um, there was some sense probably, you know, with CJ um, about the need for more rigor. And certainly as a young 20-year-old coming into that setting where we're embracing Calvinism, you know, it fed into my desire for a more intellectual ro in and robust um, set of beliefs. Um, but it quickly kind of became deterministic and, yeah, very theoretical. Um, and, and it allowed us to really stay isolated from being the, the real hands and feet of Christ. Um, and so I think how do we avoid sort of the, the quest for emotional euphoria and the quest for sort of rational control? Uh, I don't think it's that complicated, but I think it's hard. You know, the Bible says few, the, the way is narrow and few there are that find it. But I, I don't think that's because it's hard to find. I think it's just hard to actually walk the road because it actually requires us to walk in weakness and sacrifice and to be in proximity to people who are not like us and people who have... Um, often are coming from places of spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, of material poverty. Um, I, I do think that proximity to people who are in need, um, whether it's materially or, or otherwise, is um, is a big part of this. Um, and 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 sort of walking a path of finding ways to be vulnerable and sacrificial. And even that, I think, is really hard. And you can sort of w try to pursue that path in a way that is, um, you know, you're saying to yourself, I'm trusting God, I'm doing this in a sold out way, but it requires wisdom to do that without harming others and yourself. So that's where I think the Holy Spirit comes in. You need wisdom. You need the wisdom of those who have gone before, those who have done it before. So that's, I think maybe those would be my two bullet points would be, you know, embrace the wisdom of the past and of the examples of the past and, and embrace the lower way that rejects, um, you know, to quote John Piper and David Platt, the American dream. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Asbury. Uh, I've been thinking a lot since the, the revival at Asbury seems to be kind of a Rorschach test for yeah. uh, people. And uh, one of the things that keeps coming to mind, Yuval Levin was with me on this uh, podcast a few weeks ago and said something that sticks in my mind, which was, he said, people think that cynicism is the opposite of being naive. But cynicism is just another way of being naive because the, the credulous person doesn't have to do the hard work of sort of testing things. It's just you accept it all. And the cynical person doesn't have to do the hard work of testing things because you just assume nothing is what it is at, at face value. And you, you see a lot of that sort of cynicism uh, coming up when it applies to Asbury. And uh, my colleague, uh, Mike Cosper, was there 
mm -hmm. uh, yesterday as we're recording this and said you're having a lot of uh, touristy sort of voyeurs who are showing up, which doesn't have anything to do with the authenticity of the revival itself. You're, you're right. always going to see that happen. But it, 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 that's happening too. People just sort of, I want to be there to take a selfie in front of the chapel. That's, mm -hmm. that's happening. How, how should we, and you and I are both having this uh, experience of having to explain Asbury to atheist, agnostic, completely secular people who haven't seen anything like that in their mm -hmm. lifetimes or haven't paid attention to it if they have. How do you evaluate what's going on there? I'm I'm glad to be able to talk about this, honestly, and I do so with a little trepidation. I I find the uh, expressions, the spiritual hunger of the young people, so beautiful it almost brings me to tears. Mm -hmm. uh, that that hunger for transcendence it really speaks to you know what is in each of us. Um, believer or not, we all have that hunger for transcendence and for meaning and for eternity. And so I, I really just embrace and love to see young people um, expressing that. I think as soon as a revival like that gets famous, it's time to probably start packing it up. Um, that's my personal view. I'm not saying that's the right view, but I think as soon as it becomes famous and it's on social media, you know, if, if, if it's as real as we think it is, um, God can, can do that elsewhere without it spreading on social media. It didn't, it wasn't on social media before that. Um, and, uh, I think it just becomes sort of a vehicle for opportunists at a certain point. And, um, and I, and I also think, um, the presence of God is more than, uh, warm feelings and, um, pleasant experiences. I think the presence of God is quite active in homeless shelters. And, uh, and I, and I pray that this revival will, um, motivate more of these young people to live that life and follow that path. Um, and it'd be great if it popped up elsewhere, but I just don't think a sustained, my personal view, again, I'm sure there's lots of others who think differently, but my personal view is this trying to sustain something like this is the wrong path because it's not of, if it's not of man, then, you know, doesn't need people to sustain it. God can sustain it elsewhere and in other ways. Yeah. I just, I wonder, we, we haven't had social media the way that we have it now, but uh, we had media. And if you think about the first great awakening, uh, Wesley Whitfield, mm -hmm. um, and, and of course you had uh, you had these, these were becoming famous sorts of events. I mean, Benjamin Franklin showing sure. up <laughs> as a, as a sort of a gawker, but is paying attention to what Whitfield is saying. Uh, so it, it seems to me, I think you're, I think you're right in the broadest terms, but I wonder, I wonder if you're one of those young people who are in the chapel experiencing this. Um, you, you really, you can't just say, okay, well now it's time to, to shut it down. If, if it seems to be out of your control anyway, you know, if it's, if, if this really is actually a move of the Holy spirit, mm -hmm. then only he can shut it down. Right. I mean, I, I think that would be, that would I guess prop, probably what, be what, what I would, would say do. is if, if I was involved knowing what I know now mm. at 45, yeah. And if I was involved in, you know, organizing that or playing the guitar or the drums or singing or whatever, I would probably withdraw at this point. And, and, you know, it's maybe they keep doing meetings, but I would do it elsewhere. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, you, uh, in the book, 
uh, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is, and I think this is really interesting, and I think this is something that I'm not sure. There are a lot of things that I know as a writer when I'm writing, there are all kinds of things I don't even know I'm doing until somebody else sorts of uh, sort of points it out. I read this book, and if I'm just treating everybody as a character in a book, which I know isn't the case, these are all real people, but I'm just treating everybody as a character in the book. Your dad comes across as a really sympathetic, likable protagonist here, mm-hmm. even when even when the two of you are at odds. Uh, and even when it's something that I may completely disagree with your dad about, I find myself rooting for him mm-hmm. when I'm when I'm reading this book. And you you talk about some really honest sorts of fractures, and that is that is difficult. How did you how did you work through that? Of look, how am I going to be honest about something that a lot of people are facing? Sort of. Uh, kind of some fractures with family members over Trump, over whatever uh, yeah. right now. And I have to be honest about it, but I don't want to hurt him. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you felt that way about my dad. Um, I was with him last night. We went to a Maryland basketball game and uh, it was a great time. Mm. Um, and um I certainly didn't, you know, it's, it's probably like my unique to my background to even have the instinct to say this. Like most people probably wouldn't even think to even say this, but I didn't do it. I didn't write about this, you know, in a perfect way. And again, I think that's like in some weird way, I'm like holding up that (laughs) Calvinist lens to my own motives. Mm -hmm. I do think there's some health, some, some ways that, that, self-scrutiny has has been good for me over time as I've learned to sort of filter out the the more negative aspects of it. I think it's good to really hold yourself to a high standard. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, I mean there was there was a draft of the book early on that was angrier, I would say. You know, it was it was a time the last couple of years of a lot of high emotion. And certainly that included my family. And so um, it was really important for me to um, write it down and then go back through it and modulate and moderate it, um, bring down the temperature. And then I let him read it and we talked about it. And there were a few, you know, one or two things that he said, that's not accurate. And I was like, okay, good. I'm taking that out. And there were a handful of things that, you know, he expressed some, I don't know, discomfort with. And so it was, I was happy to, it was nothing that really affected the story or the integrity of the story. So I was happy to take some of those things out. But, you know, at the end of the day, after our, after that process, I sent him an email and I said, dad, these are all the times that you're mentioned in the book. More than two thirds of them are positive, and um, I want you to know that that's how I think of you. And um, I, I, you know, maybe at some time in the future, I can say more about our conversations. I want to respect some of the privacy of that. But the bottom line is that um, we are, we were, our relationship was pretty strained for a while. And um, as a result of him reading the book and us talking through it, even though he had objections, you know, and, and displeasure with what he read, um, we're, we're doing so much better. And I, and I, I'd feel comfortable saying this. I told him, like I said, I, dad, I'm not sure we would be having this, these conversations, um, if I hadn't written this and, um, and he seemed to agree with that. Um, so it's complicated, you know, it's like, there were moments where I thought, did I need to write this? Like, did I need to tell this story? And I, you know, I'll never know the answer to that for sure. But if it means that my father and I are closer as a result, that's worth it. The only other thing I would say about him is that, you know, I write this in the book. He really, one of the things that um, opened itself up to me 
in writing it, the book, was that the seeds he planted in my soul at a young age in having us read the Proverbs. I just remember so many mornings where we read the Proverbs and I just thought, again, really? And the verses talking about crying out for understanding and seeking wisdom, they just, they manifested themselves in me. Um, because that's like, I can't get away from that. That's just what I'm driven to do almost to my own detriment sometimes. And it's what brought me to a point of confrontation, um, with my own family and, and with the church. And, uh, that's one of the interesting tensions of the book, I think. You know, I, I don't know any family, just looking back sort of recent history, I don't know any family split up and not speaking to each other over Bob Dole or right. <laughs> Alexander Haig or even Richard Nixon. Uh, and yet now, it, it, the, the, since the Trump uh, phenomenon, so much – uh, so many families actually are uh, divided up in a way that doesn't feel political. It feels personal mm -hmm. for, for all sorts of reasons. Why do you think that is? Um, there's a whole book that could be written on that because it's not as simple as just Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump's a part of it. Um, and the world he comes from is a part of it. You know, certainly it was his intent to divide and conquer and to pit people against each other because that was how he kept his political base close to himself, in part by outraging the other side and um, provoking overreaction and consolidating this besieged uh, state of mind among his supporters so that he could draw them to himself. But you know, that, that's a big part of it, but um, I think technology is another big part of it. Mm -hmm. I think the dehumanizing effect of social media and just sort of internet communication, the way that we're distanced from each other, the way that we um, are, you know, in a lot of ways incentivized to uh, act out our worst impulses and to uh, disagree in the most um, vehement and uh, outrageous terms. I think that's a big part of it. And there's just historic forces. Polarization's been growing for a long time. We don't have the kind of, you know, political uh, consolidation we did in the post-war era. Um, there's many reasons to be um, at odds over policy. Um, we're we're in a time of, you know, uh, the working class being under siege, rising inequality. There's all these things in the political. So those things are part of it as well. Um, I'm curious what you, if you think I've missed any, but I do think that sort of the methodology of Trump and, and his need to divide and conquer and then technology are two of the, the bigger, if not the biggest ones. But what – would yeah. you add any to that? Well, I think part of it is one of the skills that Trump has is to um, – Peel at a very visceral sort of personal level where it seems as though he is talking to the person. Not You're not talking to – he's not talking – people who support him would say he's not getting up and giving talking points. He's he's really speaking to us even, even when they think he's lying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's there, that sort of connection. And I think uh, – I mean you talk about – I can't remember if it's in the book or if we were just uh, talking about this, about the – the way that Trump would speak about the press, uh, particularly, mm -hmm. which of course led to uh, real, really dangerous uh, situations, uh, could be in at least perceived dangerous in rallies and where people are turning around and screaming fake news and and so forth. So that that has to feel personal to you, not so much about Trump, but about you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, why, why don't you understand what's happening to people in my job? In the same way, I remember that with uh, you know after after Trump said that I was a a nasty man uh, with with no heart and a terrible person and whatever, which didn't bother me. But then after that, sort of the the bringing out of all of the, uh, I remember people in my life that uh, very close to me who were 
very enthusiastic and uh, about, and I would just say, you know, how, what right. does that mean about what, what does that mean for us? Right. <laughs> you know, just as, yeah. as relatives, I just, I don't get that at even the mammal level, much less the, the human level. So I think there's something of that uh, in it as well, that it, it feels, it hits at a deeper level, which is why the Trump movement succeeds. And it hits at a deeper level, which is why the Trump movement divides. That's mm-hmm. that's sort of just the the best I can do with looking at it right now. But w- what would you say to somebody who uh, forget forget for a moment whether it's uh, Trump or not Trump, or maybe a QAnon or January six or uh, vaccinations, COVID, all that stuff? Uh, what advice would you give to somebody who says, "Look, I, I love my mom and dad, or I love mm-hmm. my aunt and uncle, or whoever it is." I really want to maintain a connection with them, and I don't want every time we get together to be a debate about this stuff. What advice would you give to them to to maintain connection yeah. without having to go through all that? Sure. I mean, it was harder to navigate that question a couple of years ago when everything seemed more imminent, mm-hmm. um, and the and the hardest part was right around the twenty twenty election and. In January 6th. And there was definitely a real element of it felt to a certain degree like abdication to not speak up or speak out. Yeah. Um, and I think if I could do those years over again, again, knowing what I know now and having gone through that, I would do probably a lot differently. I would probably just keep my mouth shut more often, um, quite honestly. And um, there's no perfect answer here. Um, I guess I'm in a little different position because I actually do, you know, write for public consumption. Not everybody does that. So there's a delineation in my mind between what I write in my job and how I conduct myself in my personal relationships with my family. So I guess if it's just about, you know, family, you have to take into account the personal, the personality of, of each person and, and how they respond, how much they're they're able to um, engage with you on things you disagree with. With my own father, I can just say, like, I just took a stance for a long time and still we're still pretty much there that I just don't really want to talk about politics um, with him. And um, uh, and I think we're trying to sort of build back some ability to talk about more than just Maryland basketball. Um, but I would say, you know, if that's all you can talk about, whatever that is in your life, do that, do that, because that was really a lifeline for a while of just, well, we can't talk about a lot of things, but we can talk to each other. Um, and it, and it's about something that we both love and that was really important. That was really important. I remember one time uh, years ago, it was phenomenally helpful. And I remember thinking, I wish that I wish that I had recorded this. Uh, but I brought a group of pastors uh, into D.C. We're doing something else. And you and uh, Mike Allen from Axios uh, came over and just talked about uh, media and how to interact with media and, and, mm-hmm. and so forth, because I was concerned with um, the fact that you know, every pastor is going to have to, if it is only the local weekly newspaper in the small town, everybody has to, has to relate in some way to media. And a lot of times, especially in the church, there's this really suspicious kind of hostile mm-hmm. view yeah. of media, which actually the other day, somebody asked me, what what kind of is a common factor with a lot of these sexual abuse cover-ups? And I said, you know, this doesn't sound like it has anything to do with it, but a common factor is the way that they view uh, media. Mm. Because often there's this sense of we don't want the outside world to know what's happening. And that's that's why it's actually just for us to sort of pull it inside and deal with right. it in the yeah. in the corners. Now, since that time, I mean, that was that was over a decade ago. Since that time, we're at a point where mm. people don't know how to tell the difference between maybe some 
ideological bias, but in a fact-checked New Yorker article mm-hmm. and propaganda on Facebook. Uh, you know, and, and it's a sense in which they're people are reading and listening to completely opposite things with completely different views of, of reality. How do you, as a journalist, how, how would you speak to particularly Christians about how to, how to make those distinctions and how to sort through uh, media consumption? Yeah. Again, another book here, <laughs> uh, which there have been some written Bonnie Christians is a good mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the press has certainly done our share to contribute to the problem. Um, and I always try to be upfront and totally honest about that. There's no doubt that there's a a, a leftward tilt in a lot of the media, um, ideologically. Um, I think, I think sometimes ideological bias gets confused with business model bias. Um, the business model of modern media is for outrage and, uh, controversy and, um, and not so much for substance, especially, you know, in certain parts of media, like, um, a lot of cable TV, not all, but a lot. Um, and then certain, um, websites, um, more than others, I would say, um, certainly on social media. Um, but you know, we, uh, to your point, we really do need to rebuild the walls of, um, to use a biblical metaphor of, uh, teaching people how to, how to exercise discernment. And, um, and I think maybe the first step of that is epistemic modesty. I hope to talk a lot about that term over the next few months, talking about this book. It's, it's an idea that's very important to me. Um, and, and I think a lot of people might not really be totally familiar with that term. It just means, having a sense of humility about the limits of what we um, what we know um, and what we can know for sure um, and versus what we have degrees of confidence in. And I think ultimately it leads, it leads to a slowness to reach hard and fast conclusions about things because if you're epistemically modest, you have a sense that, hey, I've heard this and maybe two other things. But I need to be careful before jumping to too many conclusions about this because there might be other information out there that I don't know. I think the pattern increasingly for people who go into media silos is to simply just look for information that validates what they already believe. An epistemically modest person, you know, I would say a Christian approach to uh, discernment, exercising discernment is to have you know, what, what my dad taught me in the book of James, which is to be, um, quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. I would add to James at the risk of being labeled a a heretic here, maybe, (laughs) but, uh, slow to jump to conclusions or to reach hard and fast conclusions. I think that's incredibly important because everything now is so sped up. And a lot of, a lot of the business model of social media depends on people being sped up and overreacting and reacting too quickly. So the more that we can slow down and always have the stance that, hey, I could be wrong about this. Um, and there's potentially information out there that could prove me wrong and I need to change my mind. I think uh, the more we can uh, undo that, um, that, that system. Abhor what is evil and cling fast to that which is good. Uh, The Bible says the book is called Testimony Inside the Evangelical Movement That Failed a Generation. What would you say is the best thing about evangelical Christianity in in, in all of the failure and in all of the uh, and in all of the collapse? What's good there that we should hold on to? I think it's that heart connection to the divine that my parents' generation uh, tapped into in the 70s. Um, I think obviously evangelicals are very good at um, mobilizing and organizing and building, you know, movements. Um, That's a skill. I would say, you know, the thing that's most or the best thing about evangelicals is that really that emphasis on authentic heart connection to God. Mm. And I think there is real power in that. But I think it also really matters 
how you then funnel that and utilize it. And that's what I think I'm trying to critique. All right. The book is Testimony Inside the Evangelical Movement That Failed a Generation. There's a link to it in the show notes. You can just click the cover art and find that. John Ward, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks for being with us today. Russell, uh, I look up to you and I appreciate you very much. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening. Links are always in the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode, including a link about how you can have a trial membership to Christianity Today. Be sure to subscribe to the program, send a, send an episode along to a friend who might benefit from it, and leave us a review when you can. It helps other people to find the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Russell Moore, and this is The Russell Moore Show from Christianity Today. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Hosted by Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azare Phelps. CT administration provided by Christine Kolb. Social media by Kate Lucky. Director of operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Production assistance provided by Core Media. Audio engineer is Kevin Duthu. Coordinator is Beth Grabencourt. Video producer is John Rowland. The theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 